Good evening. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to the Hour of the Time. What you have just heard, ladies and gentlemen, is the age-old dream of Mystery Babylon, the secret societies, Freemason, the Knights Templars, the Knights of Malta, the ancient order of the Rosen Cross, the age-old dream of a perfect government, permanent utopia, up on this earth. What is Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz talking about, this 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite and member of the branch of Mystery Babylon known as the Mormon Church? What is he talking about? Ladies and gentlemen, that's the subject of tonight's broadcast. It is known as the Secret Kingdom. Investigative reporter Jeffrey Kay concluded, quote, The Mormon Church, this American Zion, wields more economic power more effectively than the State of Israel or the Pope in Rome, unquote. Actually, dear listeners, the word church is misleading when applied to Mormondom, for the power structure controlling its staggering resources is organized for the kind of absolute authoritarianism that one usually associates with a cult and not with a responsible church, nor are the ultimate goals of the brethren compatible with the normal aims of Christian leaders. In fact, in no way, shape, or form can the Mormon church be called Christian. They are essentially the same as those of cults in general, and especially those of secret revolutionary groups working toward a takeover of the world. As one former teacher at Brigham Young University has said, I quote, The Mormons do intend to take over the world. There is no secret about that. It's in the writings of Joseph Smith right on down. The Constitution of the United States will hang by a thread, and the Church will save it by establishing a theocracy." Unquote. Any who think the Mormon kingdom is a democracy are under a delusion. In fact, it is a dictatorship ruled by its inner elite circle, a council of elders. As the front page of the Wall Street Journal recently said, quote, Today, from their 28-story marble and glass, unquote, church headquarters building in Salt Lake City, Mormon church leaders oversee a vast and growing world financial empire, unquote. From these offices, their dictatorial control reaches out to every church level and into every facet of Mormon life. Whatever vote there seems to be at the ward, stake, and individual levels, is part of a cleverly contrived illusion that continues to deceive millions of Mormons into imagining that they actually have some say in church affairs. Although they do have the freedom to disagree with their leaders, to do so means excommunication and damnation. Excommunicated for openly disagreeing with the Brethren's position on ERA, Sonia Johnson has said this, Quote, the Mormon Church has become more powerful than we dare believe. It's downright terrifying, especially when you see how rich and influential it is. I really think if we could ever get an investigation, it would uncover something so like Watergate, it would blow everything wide open. Unquote. Totalitarian theocratic communism seems to be the goal. Saints Alive was recently involved in some litigation arising out of a physical attack upon one of its missionaries by an LDS, or Latter-day Saints, tour guide on the street just outside Salt Lake City's Temple Square. In an interrogatory exchange, the surprising response by the Mormon Church revealed that it was an unincorporated association without 
assets. Let me repeat that. Without assets. All wealth and power is owned and controlled by the closely held corporation of the President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Incorporated. You see, folks, church members who have faithfully and sacrificially contributed their tithes, time, and energy are absolutely powerless to demand an accounting or to change a single action by the first presidency, even if all 5.2 million of them stood up in unison and voted unanimously for it. The startling fact, folks, is that Mormon church members have no vote or participation of any kind in the corporate entity that controls Mormondom. They can sincerely perform their functions as bishops, elders, high priests, and Sunday school superintendents all they wish. But in the real world, the real world of legal ownership and raw power, they are only 5.2 million pawns. Pawns, fools, if you will, subject to manipulation from the top. All of this is part of a secret kingdom that Jeffrey Kay has called the, quote, invisible empire, unquote, and about which most Mormons have only the vaguest notions, if they have any notion at all. This theocracy is alluded to by Apostle Bruce R. McConkie. Quote, Through this church and kingdom, a framework has been built through which the full government of God will eventually operate, unquote, that, quote, full government of God, unquote, involves what is known as, quote, united order, unquote. Revelations that came through Joseph Smith described it as a theocratic, communistic society. All property and income was to be given over to the control of the church and then distributed to everyone according to his need, as the brethren defined it, so that, quote, the poor shall be exalted in that the rich are made low, unquote. Those who transgressed were to be put out of the church, in which case the property they had given into the treasury would not be returned to them. Serious problems prevented full implementation of the, quote, united order, unquote. You see, until now, it never really worked. However, the Mormon church still looks forward to the day when these revelations of God through the prophet will be fulfilled and Mormon theocratic communism firmly established worldwide. And that can only happen when the church has taken full political power. When that time comes, woe to all who transgress the laws of the Mormon gospel. Excommunication with loss of earthly property will be supplemented, ladies and gentlemen, with the death penalty. The United Order is in reality the total makeup of the full body of the Illuminati. All of the different organizations will come together to rule the world. There is a doctrine, an ancient pagan doctrine, of blood atonement connected to the Mormon Church. And since the early days of the Church, it has always been Norman doctrine that, quote, under certain circumstances, there are some serious sins for which the cleansing of Christ does not operate. And the law of God is that men must then have their own blood shed to atone for their sins, unquote. It is generally thought that these serious sins are in the category of murder and adultery. However, this is not clearly defined in Mormonism. Brigham Young, a 33rd degree Freemason, said that, quote, any man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God will be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it, unquote. In the same general vein, President J. M. Grant declared, quote, If they are covenant breakers, we need a place designated where we can shed their blood, unquote. You see, folks, my prophecy on the hour of the time that human sacrifice would return to the world will be fulfilled, unless we are smart enough to stop it. Besides murder and adultery, blood atonement was also advocated for stealing and taking the name of the Lord in vain. Likewise, the penalty for marrying an African, quote, under the law of God is death on the spot. This will also be so, unquote. 
the Mormon Church is now and has always been a white Aryan racist organization, and until recently, when threatened with lawsuits, they never allowed any other race than white Caucasians to belong. That's right, folks. And if you are an black American who belongs to the Mormon Church, you have really been fooled. All of the secret organizations of Mystery Babylon are racist organizations. The 1978 decision opening the priesthood to blacks didn't change that law. Blood atonement was also required for lying or damning old Joe Smith or his religion. I guess that tells you what's going to happen to me. But what about other liars, like Bobo Gritz? Does it apply to him? Or is he excused if he is working in the furtherance of the great work or the great plan? That most serious of all crimes, apostasy, bears the death penalty, and those who kill an apostate are saving his soul. This is a real concern of ex-Mormons. Many have received death threats, and some have even been shot at recently. Brigham Young was very firm on this subject, as the following excerpt from one of his sermons, as reported in Journal of Discourses, indicates. Quote, I say, rather than that apostates should flourish here, I will unsheath my bowie knife and conquer or die. Great commotion erupted in the congregation, and a simultaneous burst of feeling assented to the declaration. And he continues, Now, you nasty apostates, clear out, or judgment will be put to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And you could hear voices generally saying, Go it, go it! And he continues, If you say it is right, raise your hands. All hands in the congregation were raised. And he continued, Let us call upon the Lord to assist us in this and every good work, unquote. You see, folks, the doctrine of blood atonement was practiced in Utah prior to statehood until the Mormon leadership realized that they must obey federal laws or have them enforced by the United States Army, and that's the only thing that stopped it from being practiced in the open. It was, for many years, continued in secret, and there are many who swear today that it is still being carried out. There are rumors that this doctrine is still practiced secretly in Utah. It would be strange, if it were not, for Mormons boast that they of all people, quote, practice what they believe, unquote. And as Joseph Fielding Smith said, blood atonement, quote, is scriptural doctrine and is taught in all the standard works of the church, unquote. Certainly, church leaders would openly carry this out today if they could. In fact, the Utah State Legislature, with its Mormon majority, has succeeded in legalizing one method of practicing blood atonement. Utah is the only state where the condemned may elect to be executed by a firing squad which causes his own blood to be shed, and thus, by Mormon beliefs, atones for his sins. The execution by a firing squad of condemned murderer Gary Gilmore, who was a Mormon, was a recent example. Brigham Young made blood atonement sound like a generous provision that the guilty would willingly embrace and the executioners gladly perform, quote, in love, unquote. Brigham Young said this, quote, Now take a person who knows that by having his blood shed he will atone for that sin. Is there a man or woman in this house but what would say, Shed my blood that I may be saved and exalted with the gods? He would be glad to have his blood shed. I could refer to plenty of instances where men have been righteously slain in order to atone for their sins. This is loving our neighbors as ourselves. If he wants salvation, and it is necessary to spill his blood on the earth in order that he may be saved, spill it. That is the way to love mankind." Unquote. Regardless of the understanding of the average Mormon, the brethren look forward to the day when they will once again be able to practice openly not only polygamy, but blood atonement. When will that day come? In answer to that question, Bruce R. McConkie has written, quote, This doctrine can only be practiced in its fullness in a day when the civil and ecclesiastical laws are administered in the same hands, unquote. If the Mormon Church should ever succeed in taking over the world, Mormonism, in its most fanatical and bizarre practices, will become the rule enforced unbendingly upon everyone. Dare anyone call this a conspiracy? Thinking he was denying it, one Mormon recently told us, quote, This isn't a conspiracy, it's our destiny, unquote. 
As with polygamy in the past, the obsessive ambition of world domination is openly denied today, but secretly plotted. Though less blatantly proclaimed, the ultimate goal hasn't changed since the early days when Mormon leaders brazenly boasted, as First Presidency member Heber C. Kimball declared in 1859, quote, The nations will bow to this kingdom sooner or later, and all hell cannot help it, unquote. The global goal, ladies and gentlemen, is a one-world government, as it is with all the branches of the Illuminati. Of course, Mormon leaders call their empire the kingdom of God. However, their God is an extraterrestrial from Kolob, definitely not the God of the Bible. And the, quote, Zion, unquote, to which their spirit brother of Lucifer, Jesus Christ, will return to reign, is Independence, Missouri. Most Christians believe, as the Bible declares, that Christ will return to Jerusalem, Israel, to establish his millennial kingdom, whereas Mormons believe that they must establish a worldwide Mormon kingdom dictated from their Missouri base in order to make it possible for Christ to return. Therein lies a great difference, which is why the Mormon hierarchy, beginning with Joseph Smith himself, has always had worldwide and absolute political power as its goal. Mormon historian Klaus J. Hansen has written, quote, The idea of a political kingdom of God promulgated by a secret council of fifty is by far the most important key to an understanding of the Mormon past, unquote. Mormon writer John J. Stewart has said, quote, The prophet established a confidential council of fifty, are yet to fifty spelled backwards, comprised of both Mormons and non-Mormons, to help attend to temporal matters, including the eventual development of a one-world government in harmony with preparatory plans for the second advent of the Savior." Unquote. The close relationship between Masonry, the Mormon priesthood, and Joseph Smith's growing ambition to rule the world in order to bring Christ back has been pointed out by a number of Mormon writers. Like the temple ceremonies, the secret council of fifty grew out of Freemasonry. The prophet's divine revelation about the political kingdom of God came just three weeks after the Nauvoo Masonic Lodge was installed and Smith became a master mason. These men were all members of the priesthood. They all wore special robes, and the records of their meetings were often burned. Those that remain in the possession of the church today are not available even for church historians to peruse. In 1884, Mormon spokesman Elder Lunt said, quote, We look forward with perfect confidence to the day when we will hold the reins of the United States government. After that, we expect to control the continent, unquote. This secret organization was referred to in a, quote, writ issued for the arrest of prominent citizens of Nauvoo for treasonable designs against the state, unquote. Numerous sources report that shortly before his death, Joseph Smith was crowned by this secret council as king over the Mormon kingdom that he believed was destined to control the world. Not only was Joseph Smith crowned, quote, king on the earth, unquote, but so were Brigham Young and John Taylor. The authority claimed even today for Mormondom's, quote, living prophet, unquote, is still that of an absolute monarch or dictator. One of the greatest authorities on Mormon doctrine, Apostle Bruce R. McConkie, has said, quote, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as it is now constituted, is the kingdom of God on earth. The Church is not a democracy, but a kingdom, and the president of the Church, the mouthpiece of God on earth, is the earthly king, unquote. I wonder what the Pope has to say about that. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is a secret government. The current importance of all of this ambition to rule the world is evident in the secret oath still taken by each Mormon going through the temple ceremonies, a ceremony through which Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz has publicly exalted in one such oath, the patron, quote, consecrates, unquote, all he owns, earns, and is, quote, to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the building up of the kingdom of God on earth and for the establishment of Zion, unquote. In the, quote, law of sacrifice, unquote, temple patrons swear even to sacrifice their lives to this cause. 
This is not what Christians think of as the kingdom of God to be established by Christ himself, but as Mormon writer J.D. Williams has pointed out, it involves, quote, a secret government responsible not to the governed, but to the ecclesiastical authority, which will provide benign rule for all people without election, unquote. That most Mormons are not aware of the real purpose behind Mormonism doesn't change the facts. Mormon researcher Klaus Hansen's comments are of interest. Quote, Even among the Mormons, few were themselves aware of the revolutionary implications inherent in the concept of the political kingdom of God as taught by their prophet Joseph Smith to a small group of faithful followers after he had initiated them in to a secret Council of Fifty in the spring of 1844. Indeed, if few Mormons in 1844 knew what kind of kingdom their prophet had organized that year, fewer know today. The fact that so few Mormons themselves, to say nothing of non-Mormons, know the truth about Mormonism today reflects the secrecy involved and the apparent intention of its leaders, unquote. Is so much of Mormonism plotted and practiced in secret because the brethren know it can only be, quote, sold, unquote, under false labels? Can Mormons reasonably expect the world to convert to a religion that is so dishonestly and secretly presented, and much of it held back in secret because it is so, quote, sacred, unquote? If Mormons are indeed, quote, the only true Christians, unquote, then let them emulate the founder of Christianity who said, quote, I spake openly to the world, and in secret have I said nothing, unquote. The corruption is, of course, as always, rooted in power. History confirms common sense in bearing witness that whenever the absolute control which the brethren wield has rested for very long in human hands, the results have been tragic. The Bible declares that the heart of every human is, quote, deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked, unquote. This applies to the brethren as well as to everyone else. The worst despots in history have been those who claimed to be divine, and this is because humans were never intended to exercise godlike power and control either over themselves or over others. Man is inherently flawed. The concept that imperfect man can rule imperfect man in a thousand years of utopian peace on this earth is ludicrous. When they attempt it, disaster results as surely as night follows day. Much of the dishonest unwillingness to face facts unfavorable to their religion and the gullible willingness to believe the most outrageous lies that Mormons themselves admit is endemic among them can be traced to their belief that they are in the process of becoming, quote, gods, unquote. You see, they are just another branch of Mystery Babylon. How can a, quote, God, unquote, ever be wrong? Surely the temptation to live by the adage, quote, the end justifies the means, unquote, would be overpowering for anyone who really believes that his, quote, end, unquote, will be the, quote, exaltation, unquote, to, quote, godhood, unquote. Under the grandiose dream that they are the God-makers, Mormonism's leaders have developed an utter contempt for truth when it conflicts with their goal of extending the Mormon kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ to encompass the entire world. As the absolute leaders of Mormonism, the brethren have rewritten revelations, suppressed facts, promoted fraud, honored false prophets, misrepresented their true beliefs and practices, and pretended to a divine authority, which they obviously do not have. In order to control those under them and ensnare fresh millions in Mormonism, Though their religious zeal may be genuine, they have divorced their faith from truth and built an earthly empire upon the insistence that their followers dare not think for themselves or examine facts, but must blindly obey whatever the brethren decree. And this brings up some extremely grave questions. Mormonism seems as American as apple pie, and Mormons seem to be the perfect citizens with their close families, high morals, patriotism, Boy Scout programs, tabernacle choir, and conservative politics. 
A Los Angeles Times article implied that Mormons have recently gained the image of, quote, super-Americans who appear to many to be more American than the average American, unquote. Make no mind that the L.A. Times is mostly owned by the Mormon church. This may explain why such a high proportion of Mormons find their way into government. Returned LDS missionaries have, quote, the three qualities the Central Intelligence Agency wants, foreign language ability, training in a foreign country, and former residence in a foreign country, unquote. Utah, and particularly Brigham Young University, is one of the prime recruiting areas for the Central Intelligence Agency. According to Brigham Young University spokesman Dr. Gary Williams, quote, we've never had any trouble placing anyone who has applied to the Central Intelligence Agency. Every year they take almost anybody who applies, unquote. He also admitted that this has created problems with a number of foreign countries who have complained about the, quote, pretty good dose of Mormon missionaries who have gone back to the countries they were in as Central Intelligence Agents, unquote. This may at least partially explain the reported close tie between the Mormon Church and the CIA. A disproportionate number of Mormons arrive at the higher levels of the CIA, FBI, military intelligence, armed forces, and all levels of city, state, and federal governments, including the Senate, Congress, Cabinet, and White House staff. Sincere and loyal citizens, most of them, may be unaware of the secret ambition of the Brethren. What could be better than having such patriots as these serving in strategic areas of government and national security? Unfortunately, dear listeners, as we have noticed in every other area of Mormonism, the real truth lies hidden beneath the seemingly ideal image of patriotism presented by Mormons in public service. Take, for instance, Bobo Grits. In fact, their very presence in responsible government positions, particularly in agencies dealing with national security, raises some extremely grave questions that were expressed by Ed Decker in the following letter mailed to the addressees. Quote, An open letter to the President, First Presidency, and members of the General Authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Dated August 21, 1980. Gentlemen, I was recently reflecting that although the actual blood oaths and the oath of vengeance were removed from the temple ceremonies sometime after 1930, you gentlemen, listing ten of the above, are of an age to have received your own endowments prior to their removal and therefore are still under these oaths. I am particularly interested in your personal position on your oath of vengeance against the United States of America. As you recall, the oath was basically as follows. You and each of you do solemnly promise and vow that you will pray and never cease to importune high heaven to avenge the blood of the prophets Joseph and Hiram Smith on this nation, and that you will teach this to your children and your children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Have you officially renounced this oath? Or are you still bound by it? If you have not renounced it, how can you presume to lead four and one-half million people under item 12 of your Articles of Faith and still be bound to call upon heaven to heap curses upon our nation? We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And that's a quote directly from item 12 of the Articles of Faith. If you have renounced it, how can you justify having sworn such an oath to the most holy of holy places on this earth before the sacred altar of your omnipotent God and then renounce it? Gentlemen, I call upon you to repent of this abomination and proclaim to both the Mormon people and to the people of the United States of America that you renounce that oath and all it represents. I also call upon all members of the Mormon Church who hold office in our government, serve in the armed services, work for the FBI and CIA, who have gone through the Mormon Temple and sworn oaths of obedience and sacrifice to the Church and its leaders to repent of these oaths in the light of the obvious conflict of men who are sworn to seek vengeance against this great nation. Sincerely signed, J. Edward Decker. He sent a copy to President Jimmy Carter and Mr. Ronald Reagan. No response, ladies and gentlemen, no response was ever received to this letter.
The brethren are so powerful that they are immune to criticism and feel no need to explain themselves or account to anyone for their actions. And this seems to be the same, the same feeling of Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites, who attacked me physically in Salt Lake City at the Salt Dome and yelled at the top of his voice, quote, You will not criticize me, Cooper, unquote. And I say, Bobo Grits, you can stick it where the sun doesn't shine. The Mormon Church already packs a political punch far out of proportion to its size. Recently, the Wall Street Journal explained how, in spite of the constitutional separation between church and state, public schools in Utah are used to instill Mormonism in young minds. You see, in the state of Utah, it is already a theocracy. It mentioned political reapportionment, airline deregulation, the basing of the MX missile and the ERA as recent political issues affected by the power of the church. For example, when the church opposed the MX for Utah, those plans were immediately dropped by the federal government. The same Wall Street Journal article quoted the following statement from J.D. Williams, a University of Utah political science professor, quote, there is a disquieting statement in Mormonism. When the leaders have spoken, the thinking has been done. To me, democracy cannot thrive in that climate. They don't have to be called to church headquarters for political instruction. They know what they're supposed to do. That's why non-Mormons can only look toward the Mormon church and wonder, What is Big Brother doing to me today? Unquote. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a more disturbing possibility. While the election of a Mormon president seems unlikely, it is highly probable under the present swing toward conventional morality and conservatism that a Mormon could one day become a Republican vice presidential nominee. This is especially true when one considers the growing cooperation between Mormons and the moral majority. With the power, wealth, wide influence, numerous highly placed Mormons, and large voting bloc under their virtual control, the Brethren have a great deal to offer a Republican presidential candidate. Let's assume that a Mormon vice presidential candidate is on the winning ticket and thereafter the president dies in office or is assassinated, causing the Mormon to succeed him as president of the United States. And we know that the order assassinated John F. Kennedy in the outdoor temple of the sun known as Dealey Plaza. We also know that the clamor for a savior in the United States of America is reaching unprecedented proportions and many are looking many are looking to H. Ross Perot, who will cast around and maybe, maybe choose someone like Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites as his vice presidential running mate. Or is it possible that Lieutenant Colonel James Bogrites could himself be elected to the presidency of the United States of America in this climate of absolute chaos which the order, the Illuminati, has created with the help of people like Tom Valentine and organizations like the Liberty Lobby? Is this a possibility? Are you listening to me, sheeple? There is every reason to believe that the new president would immediately begin to gather around him increasing numbers of zealous temple Mormons in strategic places at the highest levels of government. A crisis similar to the one which Mormon prophecies, quote, foretold, unquote, occurs in which millions of Mormons, with their year's supply of food, guns, and ammunition, play a key role. It would be a time of excitement and zealous effort by the saints to fulfill Joseph Smith's and Brigham Young's, quote, prophecy, unquote. Quote, the time will come when the destiny of the nation will hang upon a single thread. At that critical juncture, this people will step forth and save it from the threatened destruction, unquote. Not only does Mormonism predict the, quote, saving, unquote, of America, but the precedent for an attempted takeover by force of subterfuge through political means has been set by the founding prophet himself. In 1834, Joseph Smith organized an army and marched toward Independence, Missouri, to, quote, redeem Zion, in quote. 
in spite of a humiliating surrender to the Missouri militia that proved his bold prophecies false, and therefore that he could not possibly be a real prophet, as the Mormon church proclaims, ignoring that a prophet cannot possibly be wrong. The prophet later formed the Nauvoo Legion and commissioned himself a lieutenant general to command it. Lyman L. Woods stated, quote, I have seen him on a white horse wearing the uniform of a general. He was leading a parade of the legion and looked like a god." Unquote. Joseph Smith was not only ordained king on earth, but he ran for president of the United States just before his death, at which time Mormon missionaries across the country became, quote, a vast force of political power, unquote. Today's church leaders are urging Mormons to prepare themselves for the coming crisis in order to succeed where past saints have failed. A recent major article in Ensign about being prepared included this oft-repeated warning reminder. Quote, the commandment to reestablish Zion became for the saints of Joseph Smith's day the central goal of the church, but it was a goal the church did not realize because its people were not fully prepared." Unquote. Going back, ladies and gentlemen, going back to our hypothetical crisis, what Mormons unsuccessfully attempted against impossible odds in the past they might very well accomplish with much better odds in this future scenario. They are building a hero a demagogue, someone who could well become a vice president and will, in fact, be a presidential candidate, Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz. And under cover of the national and international crisis, the Mormon president of the United States acts boldly and decisively to assume dictatorial powers. With the help of the brethren and Mormons everywhere, he appears to save America and becomes a national hero. At this time, he is made prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the Mormon Kingdom of God, while still president of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no provision in the Constitution to prevent this. With the government largely in the hands of increasing numbers of Mormon appointees at all levels throughout the United States, the constitutional prohibition against the establishment of a state church would no longer be enforceable. Mormon prophecies, and the curse upon which the United States government in revenge for the blood of Joseph and Hiram Smith would seemingly have been fulfilled. In effect, the United States would have become a theocracy exactly as planned by the brethren, completing the first step in the Mormon takeover of the world. President John Taylor boasted of it 100 years ago. He said, quote, Let us now notice our political position in the world. What are we going to do? We are going to possess the earth and reign over it forever and ever. Of course, he was speaking for the collective secret brotherhood known as the Illuminati. Now, ye kings and emperors, help yourselves if you can. This is the truth, and it may as well be told at this time as at any other. There's a good time coming, saints, a good time coming, unquote. But there's a more likely scenario. While the beginning and meat of this program presents an extremely disturbing possibility, it may seem highly speculative and improbable. There is another scenario, however, which is equally disturbing, but is much more likely, and if you've been listening to our series on the mysteries, you will understand it immediately. It arises from the fact that Mormonism is actually part of something much, much larger. We have already noted that the revelations that Joseph Smith received, far from being unique, were in fact very similar, if not identical, to the basic philosophy underlying many occult groups and secret revolutionary societies. Thus far in history, these numerous occult revolutionary organizations have remained largely separate and in competition with one another. If something should happen to unite them, dear listeners, and at the same time their beliefs should gain worldwide acceptance, as in the new age movement, a new and unimaginably powerful force for world revolution would have come into existence. There is, in fact, 
increasing evidence of a new and growing secular religious ecumenism pervasive and persuasive enough to accomplish this unprecedented and incalculable powerful coalition. It could be the means of creating the one world government that has not only been the long-standing hope and plan of the brethren and many other occult revolutionary leaders in Freemasonry and other secret organizations supposedly existing for the good of the community, but is increasingly gaining a wide acceptance through New Age networks as the only viable option to a nuclear holocaust and our ecological collapse. M probable perhaps dear listeners but certainly it can no longer be summarily dismissed as impossible after listening to this broadcast you should have a much clearer understanding of the world of the Mormon Church of what's happening in the United States of the many different organizations veiled we're behind this veil. Those who consider themselves to be illumined continue to work toward their great dream of an earthly utopia, which they call the plan, the great society, the great work. It has been their dream for millennia. It is nothing new as those of you who have listened to the entire series that we have done on the hour of the time known as the mystery schools or mystery Babylon have discovered now please understand that we are discussing the hierarchy of the Mormon Church not Mormons I know many Mormons who are good upstanding patriot citizens of this country they have no knowledge of this in fact as the members of every other church and every other religion practiced on this earth they believe mostly through blind faith and never question they do not know the basic facts of the truth or falsity of their dogma nor do they generally care and even if they knew, which many of them do know and understand, they would not renounce it and walk away, for they would become a pariah in their own society. And in the state of Utah, to renounce the Mormon Church could be a death sentence. Now, should you think this absolutely absurd, I recently took a trip through the state of Utah through the Long Valley. There is a small city called Orderville. Now, if you know what I know, and if you've been listening to this program, you know some of what I know. You know that I would have had to stop to find out why that city was called Orderville. I did, and I was amazed, for it is no secret there that it was the first communist settlement established in the United States by the Mormon Church. These facts are freely admitted in the city, and in fact they take great pride in the history of their little town. It was the first communist government community established by the Mormon Church in their search, in their search for their promised land, which eventually became Salt Lake City, it was established and named after a secret organization known as the Order to which the elders of the community belonged. You can even see it, the history, the same history that I've just given to you on the signs at the rest stops entering and leaving the town. You can get more of the history by visiting the small historical society in Orderville. It is a fact. And now, ladies and gentlemen, remember this. This program did not just come from my research or from just the research of Kaji, although our research 
follows what you have heard tonight, letter for letter and word for word. But so that you would understand that I am not crazy, tonight's program was taken from chapter 16 of a book which you can purchase yourself or order from your bookstore. The name of this book is The God Makers. The God Makers, written by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. It is called The God Makers. It is written by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. Tonight's program came from Chapter 16. It's published by Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon, 97402. That's The God Makers, written by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt, published by Harvest House Publishers, Eugene, Oregon, 97402. I recommend that you get this book and read it cover to cover. And understand that the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence and me personally, in my own research, have confirmed every single word in this book. It is fact. As for Bobo Gritz, we here at Kaji and the Hour of the Time have already proven to you in his own words that he is a liar. And we have many tapes that we have not played, and we will continue to do so until you, the sheeple, wake up. It is my sincere wish, ladies and gentlemen, that this were not true, but it is. And being that it's true, you better take steps to prepare yourself and your family and protect everything that you have worked for all your life. For you see, the members of the Mormon Church are not laying in two years' supply of food and water for nothing. Their hierarchy, their leadership, is preparing them for what they know is surely to come, and you had better do the same. Call Swiss America Trading now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. Don't be caught with your pants down, lying in a ditch, without any economic protection whatsoever. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen, the forces arrayed against us that work secretly behind what they call the veil are coming to take over the world. You must do everything possible in your power to protect yourself and your loved ones I'm not going to tell you everything that you need tonight. We'll save that for future programs, and we are going to have future programs laying out, piece by piece, step by step, what you need and what you should do to prepare. Tonight, I want you to prepare yourself financially. Call Gene Miller at Swiss America Trading, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. If you're out of the continental United States, call 602-953-6000. That's 602-953-6000. Remember, mention my name. Tell them that you are a listener of the hour of the time because you, the listeners of this broadcast, receive very special attention at Swiss America Trading. Remember, they care about you, about this country, about the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that while you may be sitting in your chair with disbelief written all over your face, don't believe anything you've heard on this broadcast or on any other broadcast. Don't believe anything that you read from any publication or any book. 
or anything that you see on any television program or from any movie unless you personally check it out and verify its authenticity for yourself. If you fail to do that, then you will always be a puppet on the end of someone else's string, and when they pull that string, you will dance, because that's exactly what you're supposed to do. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. Mention my name, William Cooper. Ask for Gene Miller. Tell them that you listen to the hour of the time. Do that now. Then and only then will you be able to look your loved ones in the eye and tell them that you have taken some positive steps to begin to protect them against what is coming in the near future. And remember this, as long as man is involved in any kind of government or rule upon this earth, there will never be, as Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz puts it, quote, perfect government, unquote. In the symbology of the temples of Freemasonry, the Mormon Church, and all along the highways in the state of Utah, you can see one of the most common symbols of that secret organization, which we know collectively as the Illuminati. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the beehive. Good night, and God bless you all.